three quarters of the Earth's land surface is impacted by humans. It's estimated that by 2050, only less than 10% of the Earth's land will remain free of human impact. This means that natural habitats are continuously degraded and transformed into agricultural land, cities and infrastructure. This habitat loss and habitat fragmentation are one of the main causes for the ongoing biodiversity loss. But starting off, what does habitat fragmentation mean? Habitat fragmentation means that um, the patches where a particular species can live, can thrive, um, are no longer connected. So there is a, a gap basically between um, these suitable habitats. And now the, the effect or the, the impact of this gap is stronger, um, the harder it is for a particular organism to travel. Think of a large deer population moving around its grassland home every day searching for new food or mates as they have for generations. Now imagine this beautiful home being disrupted by a large highway running right through it. The deer can no longer resume its previous patterns of living with the disruption in their regular habitat. With this new highway comes a thousand new dangers to the animal's way of life. When we go back to 2012, we see that there were approximately 200,000 accidents from collisions with wild animals recorded. It's predicted that 20% of the wildlife killed throughout Germany each year is a roadkill. Deforestation agriculture, urbanization, transportation infrastructure, dams, Harbors. But direct mortality is only part of the problem. The real impact goes much deeper. For many animals, urbanization and infrastructure poses an obstacle while searching for new, suitable habitat patches. At some places, it is even impossible to cross for them. This fragmentation hinders their natural movement to find food and mates. For example, deer can travel thousands of kilometers across different lands, which is quite integral for their continued existence. With fragmentation, the population is left with only a small area of suitable habitat, which may unfortunately not be enough to support and feed the whole population. Some species even have to go to specific places to reproduce. For example, frogs go back to their birthplace to spawn. Due to fragmentation, the populations will get smaller and threaten to go locally extinct. However, there is not only migration by the whole population, but also by single individuals between different populations. This is called gene flow. If human intervention makes this impossible, it can lead to inbreeding and a loss of genetic diversity within the population. As a result, over time the fitness of individuals decrease. The problem when there is no more gene flow between isolated groups of individuals, then you have these uh, isolated populations or parts of populations and quite often there is not enough genetic diversity within such a group um, for long-term survival. So especially in, in these um, solitary bees that we study or in these island endemic plants, um, such a population or whatever it is, it might be a, a deem or these groups of individuals, let's say, um, they can be smaller than 20 
individuals per season. So you can imagine that even if each of them is genetically slightly different from the others, what is usually not the case, there is not enough um, um, genetic diversity for long-term survival. And then you have these stochastic effects um, that you just lose a couple of individuals by chance and then the population is gone. The small populations with little genetic variability are less able to adapt to changes. As a consequence, the species are endangered to go extinct. We saw this in uh, several endemic plant species in the Azores where just from one year to the other, an entire population disappears because there's a landslide or a hurricane. Um, and here in Freising, we have the same problem by human um, impact. So they decided to um, upgrade the um, flooding protection along the Isar, the dam. And this means that they wipe out an entire small population of a particular bee species. And so, yeah, if then there is no more connection, no more gene flow, that's it. Destruction in ecological systems can also cause changes in natural behavior and induce high aggression in certain animals. For instance, wild bears continuously lose their habitat and are forced to search for food near or within human settlements. The human-bear conflict that has been lasting for decades results in many bears killed. Some species may play a more important role within an ecosystem. These are so-called keystone species. Their absence can result in the collapse of the structure of the whole community they live in. There are other species very important when it comes to connecting habitats. These are so-called ecosystem engineers. Beavers are a very good example of these concepts. They have a great impact on the abundance of their predators being a keystone species. And they create connected wetlands by digging channels, being an ecosystem engineer. These channels end up being used by migrating fish and other animals. But former excessive hunting of beavers caused reduction in wetland areas. If it's not only about a single species where you need gene flow and where you need to maintain critical genetic diversity, but if it's a group of interdependent species of, of mutualists that depend on each other, um, then each of them has to survive uh, long term. So you need to make sure that each of them um, has um, uh, gene flow and genetic diversity over decades. Um, it's not enough to protect a particular plant species if the pollinator is no longer there. I think on each level, it's we have quite some some losses. The focus is until now always to the let's say more bigger or in, for us obviously more interesting species. Um, and what is easier to, to detect. But we see also in primary producers quite a big loss and that might have on a long-term very drastic um, impact on the food web. In aquatic systems, we often have a habitat loss because um, when you think about dams, so river dams and so on, then you change dramatically the, the habitat, right? So, and you might lose uh, um, like the heterogeneity of a habitat and um, ju just by basic uh, knowledge from from ecology a habitat heterogeneity is very important for biodiversity that you can maintain different species with different needs on their habitat there is a substantial body of literature like also uh, yeah like saying that the effect of um, fragmentation and that these uh, fragmented or these disconnected uh, habitats are not connect connected any longer is uh, a big threat to biodiversity. How fragmentation affects a species is highly dependent on its ability of dispersal. For instance, birds that can travel over several hundreds to thousands of kilometers 
are a lot less affected than flying insects that might only disperse over a distance of a few hundred meters. I have no, no easy answer, no quick answer uh, for this, because I, I, I do think there is a, a lot of resilience in our ecosystem, so we can get away with losing many, many species before there is a collapse. Nobody has been able to stop this trend. And this means there will be more and more fragmentation. And those organisms that are poor dispersers, they suffer the most from it. And then the, the trend is um, first um, loss of a few populations and uh, uh, loss of genetic diversity in many species and then eventually um, regional extinction of species and in the long term maybe also then global extinction of species. There is even not a prediction needed because if we see, uh, look into the last numbers of uh, recent studies then we see that we have uh, since uh, the 60s uh, decline of 75% of aquatic species, freshwater species. And if we think about that, uh, most of the, the diversity is uh, in freshwater systems. I think we are already on that route that, uh, that uh, we have severe problems, right? So and if we do not do anything against it, then we can expect that we change the system in a way that we cannot expect to have the same ecosystem service. The system will run, of course, somehow, but for sure not in a way as we wanted it. So, what can we use to recover from the effects of habitat fragmentation and contract biodiversity loss? Connectivity can be ensured by habitat corridors. Habitat corridors are thin stripes of habitat that connect isolated habitat fragments. It's mostly done by planting the native vegetation to the disrupted area. Connectivity of isolated habitat patches can contract biodiversity loss by facilitating dispersal. This leads to colonization of new habitats, as well as recolonization of habitats where a population formerly went extinct. In addition to it, rescuing declining populations from extinction via immigration. A study on plant diversity was made in two areas of longleaf pine savanna for 18 years. It was shown that habitat patches connected by such corridors did have an increase of species colonization, a decrease of extinction, and a higher plant diversity compared to unconnected habitat patches. If you think about if you connect then different fragments, which are maybe also different amongst each other, so we have different habitats, and you have connections, then species are still able to get into the other habitat. And then you still uh, could have um, a, a suitable environment for yourself as a species, which is where the other habitat is maybe not so, so good. And we see that with if we dry out wetlands, for example, for aquatic systems, it's very important that we keep these wetlands because the wetlands usually provide a connection in between this, uh, in between lakes and rivers and so on. And if we still have like a corridor, let's say, for a species to get from one to the other um, patch or fragment, right? So uh, then, then we still have an exchange. And this also leads to another uh, problem, which is very often not so much tackled that the genetic biodiversity is also very important because it's one level of measuring biodiversity, right? It's very often it's only the species richness, uh, what we see, right, what we can count, but also the, the genetic variability is very important that we keep a healthy population. And that is all can be guaranteed by corridors by connections between fra uh, fragments uh, where species still can exchange, right? And that's, that's quite an important thing. The other thing is also on a wider scale, and this comes to a project which was at our station in Zeon uh, um, 
long time before I was there, but still, it's still affecting us, right? So it's still very important for our research that there were two um, lake areas which were protected, but separated. But if you have these two areas already there and the, the size is already set because it is the protection area what was decided, then you can uh, make these corridors and these corridors are then of course very important that they are wet corridors, right? So that a river is connecting them. It is also needed that you guarantee for this corridor that it is protected as such. So that you have a wide area around that Korea corridor where the anthropogenic impact is low. And that was done there, right? So that um, you connect these two systems, which took a very long time. And of course, a lot of political, um, uh, uh, let's say, negotiations and so on. Uh, but it happened. And you see on a long term now, you very often you might not see a short term effect, right? But on a long term, what we see in that area is that uh, former uh, almost distinct, um, for example, dragonfly species, which are heavily depending on their, in their larvae stages on the wetlands, but also in the adult, adult uh, stages, of course, but um, that a lot of these species, which were formerly um, almost distinct, are now in a healthy population stage back. And that is for sure also guaranteed by this connection of the two um, habitats. If the name conjured funny images of underwater rods designed for fish traffic, you're not too far from the truth. Fishways or fish steps are structures which are meant to allow the natural migration of fish species from their feeding grounds to their breeding grounds. They enable movement across barriers with a series of short steps using which the fish can leap into the water on the other side. These are delicately constructed to ensure optimal water velocity for the migrating fish. We have a project uh, where we want to change the, the bus stops in Freising and it's, it's very simple. When you think about a bus stop, there's usually some kind of hut where people can sit or, or stand uh, when it's rainy. And there's a, a flat roof of all these um, huts, but there's usually nothing on top. And people in the Netherlands, they started with the idea that they could plant some flowering plants on top of these um, bus stops. So basically make green roofs on bus stops. And the nice uh, point here is that, of course, bus stops are arranged in a network across a city. Yeah, you have them in regular intervals. And this makes them, at least in, in my opinion, the perfect stepping stones across urban deserts, so to say. Wildlife corridors are a bridge between different wild territories that have been fragmented by human development activities. These corridors have varying degrees of use for the wild. Their full function still needs further research to be evaluated. On the bright side, several studies show that these wildlife corridors do allow a higher degree of permeability between wildlands. In a study, researchers analyzed the functionality of wildlife corridors built in the Swiss plateau. They assessed the genetics of the roe deer population that inhabited those areas. The corridors which were intact showed higher levels of gene flow. This indicates more mixing compared to the interrupted regions. Bavaria has its fair share of such wildlife corridors which have been designed and developed by teams of conservation specialists and ecologists.
the first uh, points are protect and, and manage um, remaining populations because if there's nothing left, there's nothing you can connect. Connectivity is important as long as you have stable um, populations in several places. Um, but it's basically step number three after, after uh, making sure that those that are still there are safe. There is by far not enough protected spaces and those that we have are uh, deteriorating in, in quality. So we have biodiversity loss even in those protected areas and massive biodiversity losses. So of course it would be it would not harm, it would be nice to have all of them in some ways connected by large corridors. Um, but to think that then everything is solved, I think is wrong. First steps are already taken towards the widespread conservation and laws are implemented to ensure the fundamental protection of our biodiversity. Still, more laws and regulations have to be passed to sustain a healthy environment. There needs to be quite some knowledge how the fragmentation in affected the, the, the system that you do really a smart connection, right? So that the, the connections of these fragments is done in a smart way. And that's not always easy because we very often do not have enough knowledge yet how the actual fragmentation influenced or how, how it came to that status, what it has now to then introduce a, a very smart connection. In aquatic systems, the problem is that as we do have a lack of knowledge, what happens there, it's then also very hard to, to estimate if the solutions we have now are good, right? So we see that um, to restore the original stage and to guarantee this old pathways, let's say, for species is a good way. But I think we are still in the, what we say, Kinderschuh in German, right? So in, in the shoes of kids um, to understand that very well, right? So, and for sure there is more research needed. I think uh, there must be a better education for the general people. Um, how important these areas are and why we should protect some and why we cannot like uh, now uh, dry out that little creek or whatever because it's important for the exchange and then of course uh, as always i think uh, there is a big uh, need of us scientists to distribute our knowledge better and i think we are not very often not very good in that. So we, um, we know a lot, we distribute our knowledge in, of course, special journals and so on. But we, I think we need to do better science communication, I would say, because this also um, reaches then better the politicians. And in the end, it's the politician who, uh, yeah, is, it's our politics who, who decide do we protect that area now or not? Do we invest a lot of money in connecting two areas and so on? I think education is the key to everything so that we educate uh, our kids, uh, especially the kids because they learn faster than us older ones and so on, but the kids that they have a good idea how important this environment is and that we are not disconnected from it. So very often I have the feeling that people see themselves disconnected from this environment or from nature. And that's not true. So we depend on that quite a lot. So I would say education is the key to, to understand and uh, to make people aware of it because each single action is important, right? So of course the, we need uh, politics to, to see the big picture and to, to regulate that, but everybody of us is impacting. Spreading awareness has also been quite an effective tool, which is of course the main objective of our video. Me, you, 
Everyone who is watching this video have our part in protecting and nurturing the environment we live in. To ensure a world that is safe and to ensure a world that lets us thrive as a community. This is a decision I think we have to make as, as a human population. Uh, do we want to have wild spaces? Do we, do we want to invest in, in such corridors or, or connections uh, and, and really protected areas? This will need a lot of land. And I personally think we have the land available for this. We could do it and we could still all live a happy life. It is a problem of society, but society is us. That is you and me, that is all of us. Um, so when I say it's a problem of society, it doesn't mean you and I and, and our friends just can sit there and wait. So it's us and even politics. I mean, it's the people that we voted for. So if we don't like what they do, we can either run ourselves for, for politics or we can vote for someone else. So it's, it's always us who have to act. And I think the, the, the key in our personal life is um, if we want to have a different agriculture, if we want to have a different way uh, land is used in, in Europe or, or globally, um, then we have to support this. Look around you. What do you think about preserving the sanctity of the world we know and love? For us and for the future. <laughs>